In the mid-80s, the Young family set off on the first of several historic journeys. Martin and Susan Young, their little children, Jonathan and Annabel, were to travel the East Coast Main Line from London to Scotland at a time of dramatic developments. As we waited to board our Intercity 125, we were in fact at the start of a far longer and more exciting journey that would lead in the end to the electrification of the East Coast Main Line. Six years later, August the 18th, 1991, and here we are again. As you can see, over the intervening years, the family's done a bit of growing. The East Coast Main Line, Britain's express rail route between London, Yorkshire, the northeast of England and Scotland. A blue ribbon route that's always been at the forefront of railway development. A little over a hundred years ago, the Flying Scotsman took four hours to travel from London to Doncaster. By 1937, streamlined steam expresses could almost manage Newcastle in the same time. The powerful Deltic diesels of the 70s improved on that performance slightly, and in the early 80s, British Rail's new high-speed trains were just crossing the Scottish border four hours after leaving London. 1991. Enter the Intercity 225, the new electric thoroughbred of the East Coast Main Line. And the entire journey from London to Edinburgh could be clipped in just under four hours the culmination of a 10-year development and engineering project. Electrification has always held the key for the improvement of our heavily used rail routes. Operating experience on other parts of Britain's rail networks, the West Coast route from London to Scotland, and on the many commuter services in metropolitan areas, had for many years shown that electric trains were more reliable in service. They were more economic to run than diesels, both in terms of energy and maintenance costs. There was the knowledge too that travellers preferred the cleaner and quieter surroundings that come with electric train travel. Besides improvements to passenger services, freight and parcels would also benefit from electrification. Heavier loads could be carried more cost-effectively. In 1980, just two years after the new HST 125s appeared on the East Coast route, planning for electrification began. In 1984, British Rail received the green light from the government to proceed with the largest railway modernization project ever to be undertaken. A project which, when complete, would mean an investment of over £500 million and funded entirely by the railway business. 
It was to be a seven-year scheme, turning nearly 400 miles of one of Britain's most important rail routes into the world's longest construction site. The shopping list was formidable. Over 29,000 steel masts to carry the overhead wiring and equipment. 1,400 miles of overhead wire. 157 bridges to be demolished or rebuilt to take the new railway. 14 feeder stations from the national grid and three power control centers. 50 electricity switching stations. Eight construction and maintenance depots. New signaling and track work at York and Newcastle. 31 new electric locomotives. 279 new passenger coaches. Every aspect of the project had to happen smoothly and to a carefully planned timetable. It required design and construction methods that would minimize disruption to services and on many parts of the route satisfy the strict planning conditions that applied to our historic railway buildings and structures. In 1985, strategically placed construction depots came into operation. Here, all the materials needed for the line-side construction works were assembled and made ready. Specially equipped trains were operated to excavate and prepare concrete foundations for the masts. Every item of line-side equipment was detailed on a computer-controlled design and inventory system. From a detailed construction drawing for each location, all the parts needed to make the headspans, the steelwork, attachments and insulators, were pre-assembled on jigs before shipment to the line side. This was to be a considerable time saver, vital in minimizing disruption to a busy main line. Can you replace the protection on the down fast line please, Tim? For the next four years, the teams would be busy stringing out the wires, with the greater part of their work undertaken at night, sometimes in appalling weather conditions. Much of this work would have to be fitted in around a tight set of schedules for important night postal services. Elsewhere, immediately after the last trains had cleared the work areas, the wiring teams would move in. While the masts and wires were going in on the open stretches of track, the civil engineers were busy with demolition and reconstruction work on the many bridges and tunnels on the route. Many of the bridges had to be raised to provide clearance for the overhead wires. Some of these carried important roads, so disruption, particularly in towns and cities, had to be minimized. At Doncaster, a bridge carrying a trunk road had to be demolished and rebuilt on a stage-by-stage -stage basis. South of Thirsk, one of the longest single-span bridges to be made was put in place over the four running lines during a single weekend. In the open countryside, it was often a simple blasting job to demolish a bridge. In built-up areas, like the last few miles of line into Edinburgh, it was necessary to take down bridges piece by piece. Smaller structures, such as station footbridges, had to be raised for the wires. At Drem, near Edinburgh, the old Victorian iron footbridge, a Grade B listed structure, was too low. Plans were passed for this relic of the old North British Railway to be carefully dismantled and removed for later restoration at a local museum. Overnight, a new style bridge, the first of its kind in Britain, was assembled on site and lifted into place. At Edinburgh's Waverley Station, the footbridge was a major supporting structure for the whole station roof. It needed to be raised a mere six inches to allow the wires to go through. Engineers decided that it would be less costly and less disruptive to adopt this method rather than lowering the tracks. The twin Colton tunnels that lead into Edinburgh Station also underwent major reconstruction. There was extensive relining using precast concrete sections. Over a thousand securing bolts were driven into the surrounding rock to give it greater strength. The running lines in each tunnel were singled to give greater clearance for the wires. 
New construction methods came into use during the project, speeding up the rate of completion and keeping costs down. Electric services to Leeds began a year ahead of schedule, thanks to this innovative technique, using steel piling for the mast supports. In many places, this method was used instead of the time-consuming system of laying concrete foundations. All through the seven-year period, the technical design teams working on the motive power and rolling stock were meeting new challenges. The requirement to design and build Britain's most powerful electric locomotive, the Class 91. In the early months, wooden mock-ups were constructed to aid the design teams. Those closely involved with the project began to get the first real idea of the shape of this new high-speed powerhouse. There was close attention to the layout of equipment and controls in the driving cab, which would eventually have the appearance of an aircraft flight deck. Designs for the locomotive's gearbox and transmission system were rigorously tested at the GEC Alstom laboratories at Stafford. Nearby, construction of the electrical transformers and power control components was well underway. At Crewe, BREL were preparing their construction lines for the first batch of locomotives. The first metal was cut. By the spring of 1988, the first locomotive, 91001, was ready. Ready for exhaustive test running on the route to Leeds. By then, rail passengers at the southern end of the East Coast Main Line were becoming aware of quite a few changes and some of the first benefits of electrification. As the wiring progressed northwards, it became possible to extend electric commuter services from Hitchin to Huntingdon and then on to Peterborough. There was new rolling stock. Platforms were lengthened at many key stations, enabling longer trains to be run and new stations appeared, serving growing centres of population. The Class 91s quickly became established with drivers and train crew on the Leeds route, and soon proved their capabilities, at first hauling the familiar Mark III intercity coach sets, where the rapid acceleration of the locomotives soon made an impact on timekeeping. Meanwhile, in the West Midlands, design work and construction was underway for the entire complement of coaches and driving van trailers. Six different interior layouts were required. All coaches would be equipped with sliding doors to allow easier boarding. The first set of coaches would be run as a test bed, with trials extending over many months to evaluate ride and equipment functioning. The Mark IV coach was to be based on a completely new design. It would be able to run at higher speeds, at the same time providing a more comfortable travelling environment for passengers. Each train would have a complement of nine coaches, including a catering vehicle. As construction works along the East Coast Main Line moved nearer to completion, the go-ahead was received to electrify the linking route between Edinburgh and Carstairs on the West Coast Line. In a textbook operation over a winter weekend in 1990, heavy line-side electrical equipment was airlifted in to nearly two dozen remote trackside locations. The electrification of this 42-mile section would allow the growing potential of direct electric services from Glasgow to the northeast of England to be exploited. All along the East Coast route, the electrification project meant the upgrading of existing signalling equipment and in York and Tyneside, the commissioning of completely new facilities. This was the main York signal box in the 1950s. Considered in its time as state-of-the-art, 
the most advanced signalling facility of its kind. After nearly 40 years' service, the time for complete replacement at York and Newcastle had come. New technology in the form of fibre optic based communications meant that sophisticated control circuits for signalling, telemetry and digital information networks could be established over long distances. Uh, I've got uh, switch reverse, Dave, out of correspondence. One weekend in January 1990, the changeover from the 50s to a system more suited to the 90s and beyond was carefully undertaken. Can we have 874s normal, please? Switch normal, normal detection. Look. Right, okay. Hello, first signal box here. Um, we've informed all the hand signalmen. We have now closed down. I'm closing to you. Right on it. The last entry in the signal box log, as local landmarks were taken out of commission and the old signalling equipment removed. Two years later, in the spring of 1991, the largest re-signalling operation ever undertaken in the Tyneside area was completed, controlling the route from Northallerton to Berwick and the Scottish border. Hello, Tyneside. Yeah. Both York and Newcastle were to undergo major track work rationalisation schemes as part of the electrification project. Simplification of complex junctions at the station approaches had to be achieved if the speed potential for the new electric services was to be realised. At Newcastle, the famous diamond crossings were gradually removed over a succession of night and major weekend operations. Temporary track work had to be installed to allow services to continue without interruption. The creation of an island platform and the new junction layout enabled the separation of mainline and suburban services and removed conflicting train movements and their effect on timekeeping. The city of Durham, a world architectural heritage site. The famous viaduct presented a particular problem. One of the longest structures of its kind on the East Coast Main Line, it had to be strengthened, cleaned and waterproofed. It was decided to divert the main line for 10 days. The short-term inconvenience of closure would be outweighed by the long-term benefits of electrification. The track and track bed were removed and parts of the original structure revealed for the first time since it was built. Reinforcement works were followed by the reinstatement of the tracks. Meanwhile, the northbound platform was realigned to allow a smoother approach and to raise line speeds. Durham Viaduct is one of Britain's finest railway structures. Any electrification works had to be carried out with due sensitivity to protect the great environmental value of the structure and the locality. The Royal Fine Arts Commission, as well as the local authority, were closely involved in the planning consultations. In particular, with the design and visual impact that the electrification masts would have. Specially designed lightweight masts were approved for use here and also for the famous Royal Border Bridge at Berwick. At Berwick, the masts and their supporting structures were installed during the summer of 1988. There were frequent inspections by the Royal Fine Arts Commission to see how the work was progressing here and at other historic landmarks, such as Newcastle Station. We made a larger arch yes, to like cover that. the opening through, which we then think with those two windows and the windows that side, we've got windows in sympathy with the main arch. Here, the train shed roof was of particular interest. It's considered a National Railway Monument, being the first of its kind, which was to be the inspiration for other great stations like York and Paddington.
And so it was on a fine summer's day in June 1991 that a very special visitor came by Intercity 225 to Newcastle Station. On the way to Edinburgh, seeing for herself and experiencing the remarkable achievements that had been made on the East Coast Main Line. In June 1919, the directors of the North Eastern Railway received a report from their chief engineer recommending the electrification of the railway line between York and Newcastle at a capital cost of £1.4 million. Naturally, these things take time. But now, after many years of thought and seven years of hard work, the plan has been put into effect not only from York to Newcastle, but all the way from London to Edinburgh. It gives me great pleasure today to have the experience of traveling in one of the new Intercity 225 trains and to inaugurate a service which I know will be immensely popular you have built a railway for the next century, which we can all admire and enjoy. And I am very glad to mark its completion by unveiling this plaque. The culmination of a seven-year project. With electrification, Britain's premier rail route has grown in importance to the rail traveler, whether for business or leisure. Soon the East Coast Main Line will become a vital direct rail link from Scotland and the north of England to the business centres of Europe. It will be serving an increasingly discriminating and competitive travel market well into the 21st century. And it will be serving the young family and millions like them. In the 80s, the Iron Horses, the 125s, thundered north with us. Today we're traveling more quickly, more efficiently, more comfortably through our own corridor of power, the electrified East Coast Main Line.